dive in, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Apis Tactical. Apis Tactical is a new American beekeeping brand that is bringing innovative designs to beekeeping protective gear. They've just launched a new glove and there is more to come. Sponsorships like this help me freely talk about important topics in the beekeeping industry. Thanks Apes Tactical for the support. Please check them out. Link in the description. Hello everyone. This is your host, Dr. Umberto Bon Cristiani, and in today's episode, I'm thrilled to introduce a very special guest, Dr. Kirk Anderson, a leading researcher at the USDA Carl Hayden Bee Research Center in Tucson. Dr. Anderson has been at the forefront of understanding bee health, particularly in the context of microbial communities and honeybee pathogens. In this episode, we will explore some critical and timely issues in honeybee health including his recent work with Randy Oliver on the efficacy of non-native probiotics in honeybee colonies, his strong letter against the use of non-native probiotics in honeybee health, publishing Bee Culture magazine, and other topics. And now, I introduce to you Dr. Kirk Anderson. Dr. Kirk Anderson, thank you very much for joining me here today. It's a pleasure to have you in my show. How are you? Oh, good. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. Oh, it is. I I was bombarded by emails and requests to talk to you and to interview you, especially after the publication of you and Randy Oliver public publish a, a, a article about probiotics, and you you guys didn't find any evidence on that. I want to discuss this this research that you did and the whole the whole probiotic kind of uh, discussions that are circulating out there, you know, is effective, is not effective. Do you have evidence? We don't have evidence. And you are doing this for so long. I want to I wanna pick up your brain about things that happens in, in the field. But before I, I jump into this, I want to know a little bit about you. How you get into the bees, you know, how you end up there at the to so on and start to, you know, working with bees. Can you give us a little overview about your career? Sure. The, the, the real answer is I have no idea, but I'll tell you the story. Uh, so at Boise State, uh, I finally entered school. I was about 28 years old when I decided to go back to school. And uh, we went out for an ecology class. I got really excited about ecology, and, and we went out to look at this ant species. And uh, we did all these measurements and and we found out that this ant species was over-distributed and uh, they had these colonies. And then I started learning about colonies, and I read uh, uh, Arthur C. Cole's book on Pogona Myrmex. And so I got just really excited about Pogona Myrmex and started studying ants. And this is a, and then I started into a lab. The lab I started in was a molecular lab. So these guys studied plants. Uh, one of them studied Jesneriaceae, the other uh, some hybrid plants. So... And I got interested in hybridization and ended up in this lab uh, running molecular markers and aldozymes. And that was that was pretty cool because I could help them out. But then I was the only guy studying ants. Everybody else studied raptors, and which, is, <laughs> look, they come back and say, look, I got some raptor scat out of it, you know. <laughs> and they're like, well, I collected, you know, 50 colonies of, of today. So uh, it turned out that it was a good subject to work on, and I, I became enamored with social insects and their inner workings, and uh, and so I went on to do a master's degree there, and then went to uh, uh, Arizona State, where I, I got in with Jennifer Fuel and John Harrison there, and that was uh, that was really cool. But I kept studying the ants, so I was studying you know a different Pogona myrmex and and hybridization in Pogona myrmex and. And uh, I was really excited about that. And so I finished that PhD and ended up in Diana Wheeler's lab and still studying the same thing. And this, this had not really run its course yet, but it was, uh, for me, it was pretty much done. Um, you know, I was looking for a new project and the turtle ants that she was studying, which are super cool, um, they're out here in, in Tucson area. And so I love to go out in the field. So I was out in the field, blah, blah, but the, the microbiome of this turtle ant became really interesting to me, and I started to run markers on the microbiome and try to figure out, um, you know, what was going on with with this particular species. And so that was what led me uh, into this job. And then they announced this job um, here at Carl Hayden uh, Bee Research Center, 
and I took the job studying the microbiome of ants, and it's uh, it's been awesome. I've had really good lab members, uh, really good postdocs, and and really good support uh, here at this lab uh, to do this work. It's been a lot of fun. Cool. So you are in a very very prestigious uh, environment there. There is a lot of history there in that lab. Oh. And I, I think I only know about 2% of everything that that lab have provided to the world, but I, I'm going to keep my my journey to learn as much as I can about that place. I visit once there, I think it was an American Honey Producers Association meeting, and then I had the opportunity to stop by and see the lab. Right. Well, historically, you know, the, this has been considered a nutrition lab, and I've, I've done some nutrition work. I mean, I was really hired to look at the, the microbiome of bee bread, which uh, turned out to be a very vicious environment for microbes to try to survive in because it's 50% honey. So it's kind of hard for anything to survive in 50% honey. But the, you know, that was one of the first works that I did was looking at that microbiome and whether I was hopeful that it was going to be this nitrogen processing, you know, microbiome, and all of these things changed and the nutrition became better. And uh, that's not what happens. Uh, it just... It, it degrades and then the fungus starts to eat it and then the quality and the quality drops down yeah, yeah. And, and that was the transition when you transitioned to honeybees from from ants yeah that was uh well it, it, in jennifer's lab I, we of course it was during the africanized invasion and so i would help with them uh with the honeybees and which i considered an imposition at that time because you were really you know stepping on my toes doing my ant work you know so oh, oh i know i know those usda sometimes <laughs> environments uh the the nutrition people cannot touch about pathogens and their pathogens all oh, right I mean, yeah there is some fights on that sometimes like to me yeah. as a spectator is a lot of fun to watch <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> not yeah, often i feel less right, than so. prestigious so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right Kurt, um, let's let's jump in into the article. Can we discuss about the last article you published? I will, and you can you give us a little overview about what it was, how it was done, and the results you guys got. I can't... oh the the one that was published in the peer review journal. Yes, the peer review journal. Sure. Well, first uh, I want to state that Randy uh, was a huge part of this. So yes. Randy uh, Oliver did all of the beekeeping, that, and we got together and and sort of designed the experimental approach, which was, you know, him and and with bees, as everyone who works with bees knows, you can, you can get one result one time and another result another. But but in this particular case, we used an enormous number of, of colonies. So I think we started with 78 colonies and and uh, and he did he did all this work. He triple blinded the study, uh, which was which was awesome. So it was also during COVID, so we got, uh, as you mentioned earlier, so we were we were getting samples. We were we weren't in the lab for about a year during COVID, so that's why it took so long to get the to get the study out, to get all the molecular work done and through the process. But he set up basically we had two different experiments. One of them is we fed um, we fed the probiotic for many months. Uh, five or six months to these bees and then sampled them to see if they were any different than the control colonies. And uh, it, it turns out that they were not different from the control colonies. And Randy, you know, of course, the number one metric is do you get more bees or do you get more honey, right? You get a bigger colony. And uh, the answer was no. So he measured those things. And then he sent, you know, he sent good, set. we did the fly off assay and he would pick bees that didn't fly off, and we got sent you know, tubes of those that we did molecular work on. You know, I looked at the microbiome, and we looked at a number of disease markers, um, none of which differed. So we looked at nosema. We just looked at general fungal abundance. We looked at uh, um, four different viruses, black queen cell virus, uh, deformed wing virus A and B, and chronic bee paralysis virus, and and uh, none of those differed. Yeah, there's the goes the study right there. I recognize it. 
<laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me get to the figures here, and maybe you can explain using the figures here that's going to make it easier for the people at home to, to follow oh, good. what we're talking. Yeah, I'm just blathering about stuff. No, that's fine. Just just find a figure here. So in that figure, so tell me about what's going on here. Yeah, this is, uh, this is associated with the antibiotic treatment. So in the second study, we took the same colonies and we subjected them to antibiotic treatment as they entered winter. And uh, this, these are the results from that. So evenness on the top uh, just tells you how structured uh, the microbial community in the gut is. As the honeybee microbiota has incredible structure, and so you get very high evenness values, uh, which you see in the controls across the board. You have very high evenness values. There was a dip, so down below we ran uh, qPCR um, on the 16S gene, which is really just a biomarker or a, uh, what do you like to call that, uh, some kind of marker that tells you, um, it tells you how much bacteria is in the gut. Yeah, And so those didn't differ across extra. We had a little dip at 10 days, which may be due to, you know, antibiotic moving around within the apiary, who knows, but, uh, and then, but for the oxytetracycline and tylosin treatments, we had strong dips in the amount of bacteria that was in the gut, you know, directly following treatment. That's the 10 days you see it down there on the X axis. Both of those dropped off uh, significantly, and then the the uh, and the evenness decreased massively. So what happens is you lose you lose the bacteria that are not resistant to the antibiotics, and there are other bacteria that are part of the native system that move in that are resistant to antibiotics. So the gram negative bacteria are share these antibiotic resistance genes and evolutionarily that's that's where they're suspected to have got it but the bifidobacterium and the lactobacillus uh, do not have these uh, antibiotic resistance genes so they get kind of wiped out and then the other bacteria that and who knows how you know how efficient the microbiome is after it's replaced by these other kind of accessory or second string bacteria so that's something that we're that we're uh, studying further, but yeah, basically what you see here is a 33 days after treatment, the the microbiome is still wiped out. I mean, you still have low evenness across uh, across the board at 33 days. So what you're proving here is that antibiotic changes the the microbiome, uh, the quantities and the species on it. That's yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the evenness is the relative amounts of the species in comparison to one another. Yeah. So the, 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 here you can see the big differences comparing with from the evenness of the controls here for oxytetracycline and tylosine tartrate. Right. So big difference. So the antibiotics are affecting there. We absolutely, we got a sh strong all the antibiotic effect. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back here to the... Which is pretty well known, I yeah. think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, well, that's where we started any kind of, you know, we need to make sure, right. that, especially in field trials, we need to make sure at least the things we know is still reproducing. Otherwise, you, you, you're you lost in an ocean of variables. Right. I don't think it's well known that it lasts that long. Yeah, that's true. The people don't measure that far out. Yeah, so what are you watching here in this figure two? So what's the main message here? These are the controls. And what you see is the evenness that we were just talking about. And the evenness can be kind of determined by a gestalt in your mind. If you look at all the different colors and shapes, there's probably only one of these. You probably can't see my marker. But one of these that's all green in the pretreatment. You tell me that's one of point. Yeah, the one that's all green in the pretreatment right there. Green treatment. Here we go. Got green. a big long green line down below. And this one. Yeah. So that's a dysbiotic microbiome. Right. Okay. The rest of them are fairly are, are are very normal. And that's kind of what you would expect to see is some variation along the line. Not the dysbiotic. Um, that's dominance as opposed to evenness. 
where you have the dominance of one or two species. In this case, generally there's like 13, maybe, you know, they say there are five major groups. Um, it depends on how you want to break them up, genera or species or strains, but um, you have this uh, relative kind of abundance that you see in 7, 19, and 33 days. So in this is all the controls, right? There is no treatment here. You're just no treatment. Those are is, all of our control colonies. This is one colony. This is another colony. Another right. colony. And just one colony, you have a problematic colony here in the pre treatment. Yeah, that's an individual. So occasionally you get dysbiotic individuals. It's not that often. It's a, it's yeah. a very predictable structured microbiome that's in the workers. When you say individual, we're talking about is a pool of bees or uh, these are individual bees. Individual bees. So each each bar is an individual bee. Okay. Cool. Okay, we established that. So there is a with rare rare exceptions, things are not that changed uh, changed between the bees inside the bee colony in that in in this in this study. That's right. But based on the tests that we use, uh, these these don't differ from each other. Interesting. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Um, what are you watching here? Yeah, this is a treatment with one of the antibiotics. Uh, is this Tylosin or this is oxytetracycline? Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, and right what you see happen is that the pre-treatment, we have that uh, evenness that I was talking about, this even distribution of species, yep. each color there being a different species that's listed in the box up top. And then after treatment, in the top panel, you can see there's a strong reduction in the number of bacteria. Yeah. And it starts to recover. Um, but then it's introduction on other things. Look at right, so the bass here. Look yeah, at this is bad. The alpha 2.1, also referred to as commensalobacter, and this is a queen bacteria that is moving into the workers, right? And it is oh, it is among the, the group of bacteria that tend to have antibiotic resistance genes. So Giliomella has antibiotic resistance genes as well. So we see a big spike in Giliomella apis that occurs after treatment when usually it's at, at much lower abundance in the whole gut. And we see other bacteria popping up. So really, you've just you've kind of interrupted the structure yep. uh, of the microbiome, and it's this structure that that we believe, or I believe, that uh, really brings the functionality uh, of the gut microbiome. A question aside, since you mentioned that some of these bacteria that we find after the disruption uh, very likely came from the queen. Do you know if the reverse happens sometimes? What happened with the queen? Do you know what, what happened with the queen? Uh, we my, my we've been working on the queen microbiota for quite a while. So it it contains alpha 2.1 is the main bacteria. That's the yellow one here. This is the main bacteria in the queen's hindgut. But you can find it at low abundance in the workers, right? Yeah. So a lot of these things exist at low abundance. I mean, how does it get back to a new queen, right? It has to be transmitted with the swarm. So even the queen bacteria needs to go with the swarm, right? Okay. So here we have, uh, that's that's the Bartonella. None of these are queen bacteria except the alpha 2.1. And a number of worker bacteria just don't occur in the queen, including uh, Giliomella. It doesn't like the Orbacea. It doesn't like Giliomella or Fershola apparent. So those those two things it doesn't it doesn't want in there. It'll allow uh, Snodgrassella uh, to hang out in its gut apparently. So we get Snodgrassella poking up in there. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if you want me to list all. No, 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 no. That, that's fine. I'm just trying to get the 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 main message of the the picture here and translate it in an easy way to 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 my audience to understand the beekeeper. So. Yeah, like very easily to understand here, guys. 
Yeah, visually, 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 you don't have the order. So this is very ordered in the pretreatment. And then you've lost all that order. Yes. And you have a bunch of colors which represent other bacteria that are now trying to dominate the system. Yeah. And we have indications that this is problematic and could induce to health problems of honeybee. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, this is tied to whatever you want to call it, lower fitness, lower health, lower growth. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think it's virtually the same for the tylosin. We have a little bit different uh, pattern. Which is this one right here, right? And the tylosin. Yeah. yeah, so we lost the amount. There is much yeah. less bacteria in the, in, the, in the microbiome of those bees. Right. This is, we're not talking about specific parts, right? Like this is a combination of the gut. Does the entire gut, yeah, represents the whole gut. Okay, the, because we know there is some differences in, in quantities that could be biased from the rectum to the, you know, other parts of the meat gut and things like that. But this yeah, is the microbiome is, is highly compartmentalized. Yeah. Uh, at the, but we put it together as a unit and they'll examine these. So we we sequence the compartments uh, separate from each other, and you get a very different uh, looking picture. Of okay. Course. Yeah, I just just want to know what I'm looking at here. This is the whole gut. The whole gut. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So for you guys to understand again, with another, with another uh, antibiotic, the first thing that happened and after seven days, lost a lot of those bacteria, and then you can see by the co different of colors, which represents different species of bacteria here, there is an introduction and replacement of the original configuration of the microbiome of the honeybees with different guys. And what these different guys might be doing is very likely related with bad things with honeybee health. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, well, you've lost the structure and yep. the structure itself is the thing. Um, these are native honeybee bacteria. Bartonella is a native bacteria and it goes with the swarm. So does alpha 2.1. So this might not be the worst microbiome, yep. but it's definitely more deficient than, than the normal microbiome. Yeah, the structure, yeah, the way I like to talk with my the people uh, at home about about the structure, what exactly that means, is try to bring this to terms that they understand in a daily basis. Like in a city, if you lose, you know, we have a different kind of people different doing different kind of jobs for the city to work properly. Let's imagine you put a, 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 some politics, decide to make a policy that's going to compromise the the, the drivers and then we don't have the drivers anymore there is a replacement with other things and there is the city start to be chaotic and doesn't work the same way and could be bad which is very likely is going to be bad in case you lose all the you know the taxi drivers or things like that and exactly so that's, that's exactly that, it that's the way i i try to under uh, to, to explain the people why why the change of structure the could could change, should, could lead to problematic things. Yeah, in this case, your taxi drivers have been replaced with people who really don't know the routes that they're yes. going to go. Yeah, yeah, with the, with the AI taxi driver. Yeah, <laughs> or they may not be as friendly with the bus drivers yes. as the other taxi drivers were. Yeah. They may run into the bus all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Cool, so interesting. So, and then you measure, I don't, you only mention in the, the, the text here that all other measurements didn't have anything related with the probiotics, right? With no. The viruses, I don't see pictures or tables. No, the paper, uh, I didn't want to keep harping on the lack of, I mean, that's not what you do in a paper. You harp, yeah. you got a lack of effect. You say, well, we didn't have any effect and you move on and you talk about things that you did have an effect, which was the. We yeah. had an effect with the antibiotics, which was which sure enough. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, none of the disease markers uh, showed any effect. So any effect or we have... you uh... the strongest data is 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 probably Randy's. It's on his website, which is there's no change in colony size or colony weight. And this was a different kind of or. 
why 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 it's not here? Is it a different publication from before? So he published it on his website. I mentioned that at the beginning of the discussion. It's not it was not the data that was collected in this study. This was just a molecular study. I see. So, so I think that's at the beginning of the discussion. And then I cite a, his publication. Okay. So his, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Randy's work is as good as many, many, many peer-reviewed publications that are out there. In fact, probably better because he's such an excellent beekeeper, right? And this is what's critical. And bee research, as you know, is getting on the front end of this experiment correct. Yeah, I worked with Randy many years. Yeah. Uh, we have a big history. Randy is fantastic. I, I yeah. like Randy very much. Yeah, I do too. He's, he's quite a guy. Yeah. Great work. Uh, Kurt, I want to ask you something. Let me let me let me explain my point of view on that. I I did two field trials myself with some commercial available uh, probiotics. Uh, as a private consultant for the beekeeping industry, I sometimes commercial beekeepers hired me to do trials for them so they can keep this, they like to say, the secrets for themselves. So I performed once a trial for a commercial beekeeper and I got exactly the, the, the results you're getting here. There was no difference at all. Uh, with the bees however i'm i was the scientist saying look after this calculation is everything we got i don't see we, i don't see any statistically significant results here the be the commercial guy said you are out of your mind i can clearly see there is a difference here so okay so i i let it go you know as a scientist i did my job i collect the numbers and i run the the numbers and I, I didn't see it too. I couldn't see, but because I respect beekeepers, he said, "Umberto, you out of your mind. This is definitely have a difference here." So, okay, I don't want to fight. He 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 paid for the trial. I give it everything to him, and and we end up like that. That was my first experience with the probiotics out there. I said, okay, am I am I missing something here? Uh, maybe the beekeeper is, can see something that I cannot, which is sometimes is true. You know, a, a person that is working in their own operation can know their bees a lot. So, okay, I let it go. Then, li years later, after, uh, when I was at the University of Florida uh, doing research specifically for commercial beekeepers, uh, one of the companies that perform, uh, one of these companies that uh, commercialize probiotics they, they, they paid a, a field trial using University of Florida to do a specifically very similar uh, experiments. So I did it again. And, but in that time, I was shocked that I got a result. I, the bees were heavier and wasn't statistically significant. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about the trial and the problems with the trial, why I didn't publish, is that it was in the middle of COVID I lost all my students in the middle of the study. I have planned to capture all kinds of samples, to run all kinds of uh, molecular analysis and all this jazz. But because, you know, with COVID, there is restrictions. The students cannot be together with each other. And then people go on. And that, that I, I, I was the only one doing the work. And I need to deal with uh, 70 highs by myself. The only thing that I decide, okay, I need to cut the... I need to just measure one thing. Okay, what's the main thing that beekeepers want to see? If the bees are heavier or not. So that's the one I focus on. And I got a statistically significant result. I was shocked. I said, what what, what am I missing here? You know, I was sure I was not going to get anything. And I got something. So I start to look at this whole probiotic thing. Like, can I, what need? I would start to collect, okay, one, one more paper with evidence against, one more paper with evidence pro. And then when you look at the literature, you saw a lot of those things as you cited in your, in your own publication here. I want to ask you, how do you deal with that 
you know, especially with the field trials in honeybee research that we have so many variables. How how you feel confident with your field trials to pick one or another? How how you do that? Because I I don't know if I sometimes I don't feel I don't I don't trust field trials as much because of the amount of variables that we cannot control, even doing the maximum things you can. I want to pick up your brain about how confident you are on the possibility that in Randy Oliver's environment, with the bugs they have there, with the treatments they have there, and blah, 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 we're not going to have a different situation that the probiotics could bring another situ uh, another result can you can you elaborate your 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 thinking process regarding field trials and how you know how you deal with that as a as a honeybee researcher yeah that's that's a tough question uh, especially for honeybee researchers yeah. there's a lot of stuff that i think the the big story with that i followed for a long time was this product called h13 uh and it, it is effective. It would inhibit American fowl brood in a Petri dish. And everyone was excited about that. And then the, and they did a colony level experiment with it and a, and a robust one, and it didn't have any effect. And so I think that's more often the case where you have these things that work in the lab, but somehow when you put them on the colony level, uh, they don't seem they don't seem to work anymore, and you you can't really figure out why because the the colony is a very very complex place as you mentioned. It's overwhelmingly antimicrobial. I mean, this is a honey bee, right? Yeah, and the whole thing in there, and they go and they collect propolis, you know, off of these populous trees and and cottonwood trees, and they they line the inside of that with it and. So we did a study, I did a study with Marla Spivak about this, and the, there are bacteria. There seems that the native bacteria are not bothered by propolis. The native hive bacteria, so it's this Apolactobacillus conchii, Bombella, and uh, Fructobacillus, actually do better in, in propolis-rich environments. And all of these are all evolved to survive uh, in honey. And if you don't have these, and this, this, they're part of what makes the environment nasty as well. It's like there's a little bit of real estate in there, but it's already owned by these specialists. And yeah. the same is true of the gut. You know, there's this real estate, but any real estate that can be owned is already being owned by something that's highly co-evolved to be there and highly co-evolved to work with other species that are there. And that's why I think the, the big lab uh, there's a number of big honeybee labs now. Most of them uh, spawned out of the the Varan lab, which has just been an overwhelming boom for honeybee science. Um, they produce some incredible things and incredible researchers. Um, so you know you have to have you almost have to have a pre-adapted species. You have to have a native species if you want it to survive in this environment. You can't be introducing these non-native things. Not sure if I answered your question. Uh, yeah, I think I, um, the question is more like you, 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 you gave an example. Like you have this H. I don't, I don't remember uh, some kind of chemical that in the lab conditions we find reproductive uh, results. Uh, you know, reproducible repro reproducible results, and then you you always go to the the hives themselves, and we never able to. To, to get the same results and very frustrating. Yeah. What I want to pick up your brain is, you know that you if you do it again in a lab, you got the same result. But you, because the, the, the difficulties of field trials and how the scientific method is supposed to be, it's supposed to be, you know, we have a tendency to look at the field trials as, okay, we didn't work in the field trials, therefore, it doesn't work. How, 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 how will you handle that? Because the scientific method is going to tell us that to be true, you need to reproduce. And we'd never do really field trials many, many, many times the same way, the same condition. How, how can you, how you deal with this in your mind? 
as a honeybee researcher because I never was able to be sure about things looking at in the field trials or actually in as a honeybee researcher it's very hard for me to be sure about the, anything almost oh boy yeah <laughs> I you know, understand that. I wonder, I wonder how you deal with that internally as a honeybee researcher. Sure. I've, I've had this conversation with everybody who researches honeybee colonies. It's just the way they are. There, It's very difficult to have something that you call a control. You're like, this is your control? Yeah. This giant thing that does that is moving like this and buzzing and has all these behavior and has all of these substances and constantly collecting and interacting with the environment all the time. Right. Yeah. This is your control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? It's absurd. Yeah. It's absurd, absurd exactly. right? to have a colony control, but it's very easy to do these inhibition assays or these things or PCR and they get these very definite controls, you know, and you know, PCR will sometimes bother you, but generally you're going to get, you know, similar results out of it. And that was the H13 I mentioned. They did H13, inhibition yeah. athletes yeah. in the lab. Yeah, uh, which are easy to repeat. Those H13 are the 13 bacteria that are already in the honeybee gut. They're already there. Yeah. And so those they reintroduced those and that didn't do any good. We did the same thing with the hive bacteria. We introduced Bombella and this was never, well, some of this was published because it reduced Nosema loads in one of our studies, which was cool. And, uh, but it didn't really result in any change in colony size. Or in, and so we did the colony level stuff. And again, we got like, you know, no, it, it didn't seem to be doing anything. Um, I think you, I mentioned that in the pea culture. Yeah. Well, we're going to get to that later. I want to talk about that letter a little bit. It's you, you mentioned before to me that you have in the past uh, a few trials that you got some bees that were heavier using pro. Prebiotic, prebiotic, prebiotic. I think there was a bacillus in there, a bacillus. Uh, but I, we don't know what the effect was, or if it was the bacillus or the prebiotic. So this was with Apicare. I, I shouldn't mention their product, but it's in a positive light. So I guess I could mention, yeah, I could mention it. But so you can cut it out later. You also had that same experience, experience like me. Like you have a set of experiments that give you a suggestion from one side in a set of experiments that give you a suggestion for the other side. And that's why, that's why when I saw your letter that I got curious, that I'm missing something here because in that letter, you were basically saying that, you correct me if I'm wrong, that the probiotics don't, you know, the, the, that products are not useful at all. In, in, it, is that a fair assessment? When I read, there was I felt there was some kind of emotional attachment to the, to saying this is this is crap basically. Is that is that the way you see it? Because when people uh, ask me about probiotics, I feel like I don't know. Actually, I have this that work. I have these doesn't work. Honeybee research is complicated. I cannot say you anything. Uh, right. That's it. But in that letter, I felt that you, you 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 have a. Uh, a position on that that you think is useless is that is is that correct well part of the position there was uh was the distinction between science and entrepreneurship okay right yeah I, I think that uh uh jay told me that it ended the last paragraph he might not have put into that <laughs> he might not have put into that article and i said uh, i oh well. And I went back and I read the last paragraph and was like, ah, maybe he's right. Maybe I shouldn't have. That was a bridge too far. Look, I don't, I don't mind. I have no, you know, I think I think researchers need to go out like you more. To me, you know, just write whatever you you're thinking at the moment. That's fine. You know, I I I I, I like your style. Don't get me wrong. I just want to understand if I'm missing something here because as a as a researcher, I'm of course I'm not in the same category as you. You're doing this as a career, and I'm a consultant doing something, you know, private studies in a field that I'm not an expert, you know, bacteria. I'm a virologist from from background, right. not even comparable. But uh, I'm always, like, very cautious about trigger something that could, could minimize, uh, you know, uh, 
the beekeeping industry itself is already, you know, we need products. We need things to fuel the things that are there. And beekeepers always ask, sometimes they're mad at me that I don't have a position. And I say, and I explain why I don't have a position because I have two different things in my hand that I got different results. So I, I said, don't know. And I, when I saw your letter, I said, he knows. I want to know why. And I'm missing something that, because I, when I read the literature, I felt that, well, the literature is still, is still like, we have a evidence doing this. We have evidence doing that, you know, yeah. res respect to lab. But your, your letter gave me the impression that I am missing something. That's what I'm trying to do here. What am I missing for you to be sure that, not sure, but, uh, no, that's not fair. Let me, let me put this back and take this back. You are fair saying that entrepreneurship sometimes, actually a lot of times, messed up and only want to push for profit. We know them. Well, it just generates a bifurcation is what it does. I'm not saying that, that well, everybody's crooked who wants to make a Yes, I'm sure. Not, it, what it so, does is it generates a bifurcation. Like I have desire now to make money. Yeah. And I have desire to do what's right. You have both desires. That's a bifurcation. To do what's right. And I'm, I'm fair with that. Sure. And making money is often, no, I, that, I think that's what's right. I need to make some money you make to for make my family money. and my kids. Yeah. I, I also believe in individual accountability. You know, if somebody decide, that's something that I do in my channel a lot. Look, I have, I have a no position. Even when I have a position personally, Sometimes I'm avoid to say it. I said, look, these are the facts that I know. You are responsible for your decisions at home. You know, mm -hmm. you know I, I, I truly believe in personal responsibility. You know, I think we're lacking just with my kids. Like, you know, oh, you, that's your decision. Don't, don't ask me to, to clean your, your mess. You clean your mess. That's you know, right. People are looking for saviors and things like that. So it. I, I believe in personal accountability. So that being said, when the beekeeper make a decision to buy those products and he knows, or he didn't do a research to see that, you know, we, we have research from this side. I also have researching pointing to this side. So whatever decision he's going to make, he can't blame anybody other than right. themselves. Right. I, yeah. and I think that was basically the uh, what i saw in the letter look we have entrepreneurs we have we have the science here and i think that's where you're pointing in that letter you know I, I and i love it when researchers go out and say whatever want to say you know it is <laughs> i appreciate a lot you know when you when researchers go and 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 speak out like the way it is because sometimes we we're right, sometimes we're wrong, and no, I just want to thank you for, for to bring the point of the entrepreneurship, you know, the, the dangers of that, uh, pointed out the, the experiments that you have. No, that was, that was an interesting way to see it. Uh, I have no stake in it either way. Yeah. But you don't... If you, you want doing the research. Yeah, but you don't believe there is, for example, Somebody who's not hopeful. Uh, like, uh, I got this yeah. question from this commercial guy, and I want to I wanna bring it straight to you because my answer was, I don't know. So, like, he asked me, Umberto, do you believe the probiotic might have a benefit, a benefit in some sort of situation that we, like, that is not in those papers? My answer is, yeah. I, I, you know, yes, I guess, yes, that's what I'm going to yeah. say. I uh, like, like in your example, the, 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 the genetic of the bees, the radius bees, I don't know if how, around pesticide too much. I don't know the conditions. Do sure. I believe there is other conditions that the probiotics might have a beneficial effect? Yeah, I believe it, but I want to see it. You know, I want to see, I want to see data. I want to see results. And the only data and results that I have in my hands is 50-50. Two trials that I did it myself. So right. I, what I tell you, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, do you, what do you think? Do you think there is possibilities there? Or what, what areas of research would you, would you like to see done to, to convince you that, you know, that 
maybe this area we might have something. There is any any area that crossed your mind or a situation combination of of uh, of, of uh, uh, variables that you think that maybe occasionally in this situation those probiotics might be beneficial here somehow. The the non-native probiotics, I would yeah. say there's not much hope for non-native you, probiotics. You, so that's your position. You don't you don't have much hope on that. That was pretty clear. I think the you know they have. Uh, so I wrote about human probiotics, which by no means am I a, a, a master of that that wheel of energy there. But they, uh, uh, there are conditions where human probiotics work and they work well yeah. in a number of situations. And but only that's again that's only about you know five percent of the things on the market. Oh, the uh, rest of them survive through advertising and yeah. and. And, yeah. and they put out pseudoscience about what a microbiome is and what, you know, what a probiotic is. And here's why ours is better than this other one. And they're, they're really not tested at all. So there's no regulation on these things. And so you can say really whatever you want. You can make all these claims about what it does, but you don't have any, any information to back up what you're saying. So you're very right. Like it needs to be a lot of information. There needs to be like an independent body that, that does this kind of work. Uh, so you can say, well, we had this independently tested and that's, you know, Randy's kind of an independent body. And so am I. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess. Uh, and so this, you know, the, certainly the data that we got from this, experiment, which was we sequenced, we really looked with great detail to try to find any of these bacteria that were introduced as probiotics to find some of these in the system. We, we, you can't even find them. And that's just the explanation for that is they do not survive the hive environment, that none of them are evolved to survive in the hive environment, period. They don't I, even, I mean, they mean they introduce them with sugar. So they're immediately, like any sugar, taken up into the crop uh, of, of the worker bee, right? And at that moment, uh, the, <laughs> they are dead. They, that's it for them, right? And it, and I, it's amazing that we couldn't even really find the 16S sequence of any of these things. So none of them established anywhere in the gut. Yeah, that was surprising to me because right after to put, apparently everything disappeared. And you put, a, yeah. it's, it's a big quantity of the bacteria. Well, we got 14 million reads. That's 14 yeah. million of these barcodes, each of them, you know, from some type of bacteria that's in there. So it was a really good look to see if any of these things were in there. And Damico, this has been repeated. Damico did the same yeah. study. Yeah. And they couldn't, they could not find, you know, I praised them because they sequenced the, the probiotic material itself, the stuff that you dump into the, into the hive with the sugar where the bacteria are supposed to be. And there are some bacteria in there. We, uh, uh, we grew them in the lab, you know, there's a couple of orders of magnitude less than they say. And I think their yeast counts are, are still pretty high, but, uh, you know, the Damico couldn't find any of these things in there either. Yeah. Those, those, I follow those. This is something that I like because we, when many different places are doing similar res, uh, experiments and getting similar results, that's where I start to be more confident to go one direction than another. But yeah. what what breaks my mind that I can't be sure about things is like situations like, okay, let's imagine, you know, because most of the Randy's bees are pretty healthy. Oh yeah, it, it's got good bees. But that's, that's, and that's the thing. I think, it, there, do you think there is a situation that the bees are damaged by something, pesticide use or whatever pathogen, you know, I already destroyed the, the, the structure that you normally mentioned here, that those probiotics could be adding there and have a beneficial effect. I cannot say no to that possibility. That's why I never say to the beekeeper that I, I don't see it. I'm, I'm hopeless, like the way you, right. you are. You said you, you have no hope. I, I feel like when I talk with beekeepers, I cannot say I don't have hope because... Maybe it's, we need to see. Oh, I just mean that I'm not hoping for a particular result. Oh, okay. I don't mean that I'm completely without hope or faith. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just not hoping for a particular thing to happen. Okay, 
right? Uh, yeah, because it's something that crossed my mind all the time. Well, it's something that I cannot say, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah there is damage. You could interview some of these people from the Moran lab. So they're working, you know, they, they're introducing, but these aren't, this isn't the probiotic effect. This yeah. is something entirely different that, that yeah. you would understand well, given your background, probably better than me and Jay would understand it too quite well, but they're introducing double-stranded RNA into the bacteria that they then introduce. So this is trans, I forget what they call it, where, and you're just introducing a therapeutic and yeah, in one case, I think they've knocked down varroa mites, so they get RNA interference in the varroa mite. Yeah, yeah. Is this this is the... the vehicle to deliver that is one of the honeybee uh, native honeybee bacteria, the Snodgrass cella bacteria. Yeah. Right. I, I interviewed a gentleman. I forgot his name. That prob published in Science. I, I interviewed him in the past. That's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. The problem yeah. with that is the acceptance. And acceptance of the people because some people might consider that genetically modified and you know then well that is genetic it is modified. it is genetically <laughs> modified and then is a whole level to to bring this to the market is very hard when the people at home doesn't know too much about genetic modification there is it's just like a tool there is good genetic good good ways to use it and and bad ways to use it and yeah. It's it's an it, it's another interview uh, completely right there. It it really is. That's an interesting. It's an interesting approach. So of course they're going to try to use uh, the microbiome as a vehicle to introduce all kinds of therapeutics and medicines. That's where the future is. That's what they're going to be doing. Yeah, no question. That's what already happening. Yes, and it, yeah, but that's not the microbiome itself. No, it's my not. position that the microbiome as it is is pretty darn good. It is unbelievably amazing. There's really nothing like it in nature. What? How surprised was you as a researcher when the the people discovered that the, the, the gut microbiome was so simple with a few species? Because as a researcher myself, compared with other other species, organisms that I look at the internet, at the, at the PubMed, I was expecting the gut microbiome to be huge with you know, hundreds of, of species. And right. then there is just a couple. How how surprised was you at the time? And what what's your thoughts on that? On I did not know at the time that what other microbiomes look like. So uh, when I learned about that, and then Nancy Moran, I did a paper in 2012, and, and it was showing that the microbiomes of these two uh, geographically distant groups were incredibly similar, right? Um, well, statistically uh, indistinguishable, I guess would be a better way to put it. And then that really solidified, well, this is just the Apis mellifera microbiome. And it, it turns out to be, I mean, there's some variation geographically, um, but largely it's, it's exactly the same species of, you know, some places in and who knows if this is geography or just a particular experiment like we were talking about earlier, uh, where Bartonella is a lot more evident and some of these other bacteria show up more often than they do. But generally, it's just the same thing. You know, with humans, you, you can't find two people who have the same microbiome. Yes. But the quantity was is expected for uh, for comparing with humans, cows, and but when I see the honeybees have a you know couple of species, I was I was shocked. But at, then after thinking about well maybe something related with the social environment and there is a lot of honey there and a lot of you know propolis is supposed to be growing only very tough specific bacteria that co-evolve with them for thousands and thousands of years. It's it's not an environment that easy for microbes to grow. No, it's evolved with this in incredibly, so stole things from, apparently, from the foraging environment and the floral environment. Yeah. And those things became more and more able to live just in the honeybee and then uh, move with the swarm. So the swarm is, I think, the essence of why it is so particular and so predictable is that swarm has had contact with every swarm back through the ages. Huh. That's how it's transmitted, swarm to swarm to swarm. Yeah. And it's nothing but, you know, that, that swarm you're holding on to 
stretches back through the eons. Wow. In terms of contact, right? Yeah. Where you have thousands of functional microbiomes in every worker in that swarm. Wow. Yeah, honeybees keep keep amazing me every every time. Is yeah, this is yeah. I love. I've always loved social insects, but the yeah study in the microbiome of this one of the most unique social insects has just been. It's been so much fun. I've really yeah. I've really enjoyed it. Is this a feature of only honeybees or all all social? Uh, well, no, the insects. To, to have a very limited amount, species-wise, number of species in the, the gut microbiome. Yeah, you don't see anything like it. So these things that have to overwinter, you know, you have, there's a number of species that are individual. They get put in a nest. The bees get put into, a, you know, solitary bees get put into the nest and whatever ends up in their larval development and so on. And uh, there's nothing that has this budding, you know, if you have this budding structure, that's where I think you have the potential um, for this type of evolution to occur with the microbiome and the host. Um, yeah, the others where you have this very distinct, you know, I laid an egg and, and something got smeared on that egg and how well does that thing move into the adult generation? Right? What we have here is we have direct contact with adult generation to adult generation to adult generation that yep. never stops. Yep. Right? And that's, I think, what's allowed this this evolution of such a particular and beautiful microbiome. Yeah. And no, I don't think it needs any help. When when they're intact, if if it, well, if if they're yeah. damaged, if they're damaged, maybe there, we need. Yeah, there may be strain, you know, combinations of various strains that work better than others, a little bit better. But all those strains are still within that group. And how are you going to reintroduce them? into that group when they're already there. And the same thing with, you know, the stagrass oil, you're going to put it in there. It, it's going to get replaced by a more efficient stagrass oil. You're going to have to make it very efficient at what it does for its job as part of the microbiome and the host interaction, right? And then on top of it, you know, put this energetic constraint of you have to pump out double-stranded RNA all the time, right? Yep. Is that going to be okay with that system? Is that taxi driver going to be all right? That, that would be something to, very interesting to see. Yeah, I don't know. And I think, uh, I don't know, I think everything's going to be done, of course, and, and they're going to figure out a way to do it all. Um, yeah. Kirk, yeah. Be, before I wrap this up, I want you just to know a little bit, what, what other projects are you doing right now with the, the B Lab there that you, you want to people to know? Oh, we've had a huge project. Uh, uh, it's an AI project diagnosing uh, brood disease. So we've got all of these incredible images and and molecular signatures of brood disease, and we're trying to turn this into a, an application where you could just take a picture uh, of your brood disease. And we'll be working with Muhammad Al Baraki. Al Baraki. I've just been chatting with him a bit. If you know Muhammad, he's pretty, yes, he's really cool. He's got a lot of great ideas, so we're going to try to make this, try to make this app uh, that beekeepers can use. To just is a, you take a picture of the frame, and then you diagnose the the, the yep. blue disease, and you can diagnose disease with just a picture. Interesting. Well, it's a bit difficult because there's a lot of this. You know, the, we started with the most difficult uh, kind of determination which are these blobs of larva, right? Yeah, and yeah, so you yeah. could get a blob looking larva for EFB and you can get a blob looking larva from, from virus, but we've got it trained pretty well to be able to distinguish the virus from the EFB. And it does, you know, it does way better than I think the gestalt of a person, but who knows, you know, it's, there's lots of skeptics about AI too. It's all about how you use it and what you use it for, right? It's a new tool just yeah. like, with some tools and energy, we can create good things or atomic bombs. It's up to us to decide how to use the tools. Yeah, Dwan Copeland, so he's my he's my postdoc. He's been really champion this work. He's been working uh, super hard uh, moving this down the field. He's impressive. Oh, uh, so just tell him to, res I'm going to send him an email to, to talk about this project. <laughs> okay. In the it's future, a, yeah, that would be great. It's really cool. He, he would love that. 
All right, Kirk, do you have any message for beekeepers out there, you know, about the work you're doing or the, the mission of the lab? You have the open floor for you. Yeah, my, uh, I would say relative to what we've been talking about, if, if something works for you, do it. I've, I've heard stories like, well, that can't be true because I've been using this and it works well for me. Well, if that's true, keep doing it if it's working and it. If the, the second thing you should do is uh, is uh, set up a situation where you can do your own research, right? Where you yeah. can discover your own truths. And if you, you know, you need to work somebody, um, you know, Randy got, uh, he gave, I think he donated, like, not donated, he gets donations from beekeepers. He gave us, you know, so I think 8,000 bucks to help with, to help with this work. And it was a good that was a good amount to help get some of this work done. It doesn't come cheaply, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I bet you don't come cheaply either, Umberto. I would, uh, I, well, yeah, I need to survive. I need to say that. Right. <laughs> so it's hard it work. The bees, yes, and it's a lot of work. Yeah. But the, the, the commercial guys that hire me, they have, they have the means and the people that could help me. So for them you know, doing it for themselves, just paying for my time, it's not, it's not a big deal for me to, to organize and make the things scientifically, you know, accurate. Uh, but the, the, the hard work, maybe it's just me with the, with the workers, you know, just observing and, uh, and they keep, and they keep their, the truth for their operation. That, that's something that I think is important. The right. commercial guys out there, you know, there is so many situations when I do experiments specifically locally, that's very likely it's going to be something that might be repeatable over time in your operations. You never know when you have one species of plant plant in your neighbor that's going to mess up your own operation. Right. So, yeah. So, if you want to hire me, I'm here. Uh <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, it's been great to talk to you, man. I thank you yeah. very much for this opportunity. Now, my pleasure. And I'm looking forward to, to meet you one of these days and have more conversations about the, the, the rest of the projects you're doing and and thank you to to put this uh, all this effort out there to 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 show us the things that you know that nobody want to see it sometimes <laughs> you're welcome my okay. you think randy randy's the one yeah that I'll, really started this i will bring i'll be i'll bring randy here to discuss this too yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna invite him yeah i will take full credit though you can give it to Rick. Okay. <laughs> Kirk, thank you very much for your time. And we, we from Inside the Hive TV really appreciate. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. And for you guys at home, thanks for watching. See you guys in the next video. Inside the Hive TV, the show about peace. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>